solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Craig Allen Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R. Thank you. Judge Israel Good morning. Please be seated. All my uh, pleadings right on the chair. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Before, what's the case number? Case number A832506 W. McDonald versus uh, the state. Council, state your appearance. Karen Mishler on behalf of the state, Your Honor. Nancy Lemke on behalf of Mr. McDonald. Uh, good morning. So an issue came up uh, regarding the uh, same, thank you and of the entirety of uh, coverage um, and uh, a <clears throat> proper request was filed, but the considerations I'll go over them. Rule two thirty of the. Um, Nevada Supreme Court rules um, the impact of coverage upon the right of any party to a fair trial. Well, uh, that doesn't really apply. Uh, the impact of coverage upon the right of privacy of any party or witness. Um, so uh, that clearly uh, is an issue to um, either of you want to speak to that? The, the state has no position on the, the presence of the cameras in the courtroom. And Your Honor, on behalf of Mr. McDonald, I, I, um, I certainly understand the need for cameras in the courtroom. I think it's important in our society that we, that we have that, um, the ability to have um, access to what's happening in a court of law, particularly in a criminal case. My concern here is that we are going to get into privileged private matters that there, um, this is not like necessarily a regular criminal trial where there's an attorney-client privilege that exists that's not going to be breached for the public to see. Here, you're going to we're going to get into matters that relate to, I'm guessing, discussions between Mr. McDonald and, and his trial counsel and other things of that like. And to the extent that there is a privacy interest that's created by that, it will be, I think, encumbered a little bit by the by the presence of the cameras capturing information that would otherwise be privileged and private. So to that end, um, uh, and you know, to the extent that, that would ultimately end up prejudicing Mr. McDonald in some way, um, I would ask the court to consider excluding the cameras from this type of proceeding. If I may be independently heard, forgive me on my own behalf. Certainly but you are an expected to be a witness. I would so be, and I don't directly talk about witness. I'm here voluntarily at the request of the party. You go by one of the microphones. I'm here independently. Just working. Give us your name, too. Craig Mueller, on my own behalf, Your Honor. Your Honor, I volunteered to help Mr. McDonald uh, pro bono. This was a pro bono project to that end, anticipating it was going to negotiate. It did not, as the court's well aware. I uh, had some very strong feelings that I've like, done my best to be polite in expressing to all the parties about this case. At this juncture, however, this testimony is going to go into the inner workings of my office, the inner workings of my communications with my client, the inner workings of the procedures, none of which the public has any particular interest or knowledge in. We've got nothing to particularly to hide, but the cameras here are not going to enlighten the public and they are going to discourage me and further attorneys from doing pro bono work in the future. And I object independently, and also Mr. McDonald is not here to release me from my attorney-client privilege either. He's not here? I expected him here, Your Honor. I talked to him as recently as yesterday in preparation for the hearing. I, I mean... We can't go forward. Well... I... He was here, right? I, yeah, I was hoping that at some point, maybe during our discussions, he would come in. Um, I have to canvas him that he is waiting right. his... That's correct. I think I might have done it 
this has been going on for quite some time, but I need to do it again. Oh, he's on his way up here. Okay. Um, all right, then go ahead with your... Your Honor, I just... Uh, in it will come out of testimony that Mr. McDonald was at his spare desk. I was rent, uh, renting Craig Kenny's old building at his spare office, actually several spare offices. I gave Mr. McDonald a, off, a desk in an office to work as a paralegal, not as a paralegal, as an intern, uh, to work on his cases and to help me on a couple of other small matters, um, all of which is going to go into the inner workings of my office and the details of how that went down, none of which needs to be made public and is not relevant or particularly probative to the issue and nothing that the public needs to know about. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third, let's see now, the impact of coverage upon the safety and well-being of any party, witness, or juror. Um, that's, I guess, tangentially been discussed. The likelihood that cover, coverage would distract participants or would distract from the dignity of the proceedings, um, that's not very likely. However, distract from fully testifying in candor, apparently both um, the uh, Mr. McDonald, the uh, individual, uh, with the PCR um, has, or at least through counsel, has said that uh, might be affected and the adequacy of the facilities is not an issue. Um, the Supreme Court has, uh, and, and there is a, um, a presumption in favor of coverage when it comes to uh, filming uh, trials. Um, this is not a trial, uh, and the Supreme Court does um, certainly have restrictions, for instance, uh, not filming witnesses um, or jurors, um, and uh, we clearly have that uh, that will be happening. Mr. Mueller will be a witness, and he is obviously not consenting to his filming. Um, so, uh, and that's apparently solid, S-O-L-I-D versus the 8th Judicial District, 393 Pacific 3rd, 666. Um, so, uh, I will allow filming of any arguments, but the witnesses, and I assume uh, Mr. McDonald is also requesting that he not be filmed. Is that, am I correct in that? Well, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't know that Mr. McDonald necessarily is, uh, well. Since he just got here, do you need a minute to yeah, discuss with let, him? Let me talk to him. All right. Okay. Your Honor, and I do, I need to sound like a, I gotta just say this. Judge Silva admonished the same organization on how to use the cameras in a courtroom. They ignored it and caused a mistrial on the other proceeding. I, they, you know, they've got an 0 for 1 track record as following court at an admission. Well, when you're testifying, that will be not only unplugged, but not in the courtroom, the Thank you, Judge. video camera. And I don't know, Matt, did you get a chance to talk to Mr. McDonald? I did, just briefly, Your Honor. Um, I think we have a little bit of differing opinions on this. I, you know, Mr. McDonald has always maintained, I think, relative to the entirety of the allegations, that, you know, he doesn't have anything to hide, that, you know, he... Um, you know, he wants to be forthcoming and, and what he, what information he provides to this court. I personally don't think it's in his best interest to be filmed. And so to that end, as his representative, I would, you know, tell the court that I am not in favor of him being filmed on camera during testimony, which is obviously going to involve some testimony regarding otherwise privileged material and discussions between him and his then trial counsel. I 
I know. I, my apologies, Your Honor. I just, I, I, I would. You talk to him. He's obviously has questions or issues. Court's indulgence. Oh. But may, may I go in the back? Absolutely. Okay. In the, uh, in the. Uh, oh, room right here. No. Take it oh, okay. You have an ante room right here. Okay. Heck yeah. Correct. All right, we'll say the recess. May you see it come to order? Court is back in session. Okay, what did Mr. McDonald or what did you decide? Your Honor, as Mr. McDonald's counsel, my position remains the same. Um, same objection stands. Okay. The, does that mean Mr. McDonald wants to testify, uh, want, wants to be filmed while he's testifying? Uh, <laughs> he's shaking. Uh, I mean, I, yes. yeah, I mean, Mr. McDonald and I have a difference of opinion, but tactical decisions are left to the purview of counsel. And to well, that that's end, true. It, it's, you know, if this was a decision about something else, you know, entering into a negotiation or, you know, the other. Fifth Amendment rights that are, that are conferred to a criminal defendant, then it would be his within his purview. It's a tactical I, decision. I I agree. The Supreme Court has made it clear that those type of decisions are left to the attorney. Um, if it was a you know plea or something like that, you're absolutely correct. That's his decision. Um, whether. I don't even want to get into it, but whether he chose to represent himself or something like that would also be his constitutional right, but this is a, I, I guess the right word, is a tactical, a, a decision that attorneys normally make. Um, Judge, may I speak to that? Well, once again, I don't know if your attorney wants you is, you know, anything. In, in the spirit of transparency, Judge, that's why I would say allow it. It's going to, it's, you can pull the records for re, for re video or recording. In this case, it's been open since the inception anyway. So I, I don't, I don't mind, Judge, that, that for transparency's sake. So I think it's. And that's why people have lawyers, Your Honor. And yes, I'm exactly. Sure. To, I can't tell you how often, uh, clients uh, say the wrong thing and uh, that's why they have lawyers exactly all right um, and again this is um, this is not a trial this is a post conviction and so I'm gonna uh, follow um, the attorney's request um, so that's what we'll do. Uh, first of all, well, not first, we're already halfway into this. Uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, you understand by um, filing this and, and uh, uh, arguing ineffective assistance of counsel, you have to waive your right to attorney-client privilege. Has your attorney explained that to you? Yes, sir. And are you willing to waive your attorney-client privilege? Yes, Judge. Uh, you understand that um, in the questioning, certainly uh, the state will uh, generally try to avoid um, factors or questions that um, are not directly related to the issues in your post-conviction relief. However, by opening that door regarding attorney-client privilege, things could come out that are not expected. Uh, so do you understand that? Yes, sir. That the state's going to ask you questions and uh, and, and ask your uh, attorney questions that um, you might not particularly want uh, to have answered. 
Yes, Judge Anderson. All right, so you uh, fully understand you have no questions regarding waiving your uh, attorney-client privilege? No, no, Judge. All right, thank you. So uh, I've read the 150 or so pages of all uh, that we have, so I certainly don't think there's a necessity for any sort of uh, opening. Um, so, uh, defense, call your first witness. Uh, the defense would call. So, Your Honor, just so that the, the court is clear, as I as I indicated in um, my argument initially when we first came before Your Honor on this, is that. It's my position that, that I have um, raised the claims um, regarding ineffective assistance of counsel when there has been no explanation yet by the state as to whether or not the failings of Mr. Mueller as set forth in the pleading can be explained by you know tactical or strategic decisions that were reasonable. Um, with that in mind, um, I, my first witness then would be Mr. McDonald. Good point, sir. And because, as I said, counsel has uh, requested that he not be videoed, um, I'm not going to allow videoing. Uh, Alex here, and as promised, I am going to go ahead and give you guys an uh, explanation as to why all of this was one big shenanigan. And I really do want to preface, before I go into the explanation, that this is not an isolated incident. Other judges have pulled stunts like this before, judges and lawyers both, but this is the first time it's happened with such a high-profile case on this channel. The Michael McDonald case is one of our top three cases for certain, and you all got to see this live, which, believe it or not, as frustrating as what Judge Israel and the attorneys did is, um, is it's, in a sense, still something of a blessing that you were all able to actually see as much as you were, because usually stuff like this just kind of gets lost in the wind when it comes to people um, complaining about misconduct from the bench, misconduct, for, uh, misconduct from attorneys. It's rare for something like this to actually be, uh, actually be captured on high-definition video, and we have done that before, but as I mentioned, um, with the other incidents, it was uh, lesser uh, cases of lesser interest, so this is the first time I think most of our audience got to see this. So the first thing I like to do is expose the contradictions. Now, I do have the the transcript and I do have the JAPS releases, even though uh, District Court Judge Ronald Israel tried with all of his might to resist releasing the JAVS videos to me, he did end up capitulating once I got an attorney involved. So starting from the top of the list is the impact of privacy argument that uh, Judge Israel and the attorneys raised. This is something that the Supreme Court put in there, in the rules, for ordinary people. And I've been doing this since 2019, and every single time the privacy argument was asserted, it was an attorney. When it was in front of District Court Judge David Jones in our coverage of uh, Kurt Harris versus Ernest El Casal, three times the privacy objection was raised, raised, and all three times it was attorneys. When it was done in front of uh, District Court Judge Michael Montero, again, an attorney. Here, in front of District Court Judge Ron Israel, two times attorneys. In fact, some people might say, well, hold on, Michael McDonald isn't an attorney. But if you listen carefully, Michael McDonald did not object. It was his attorney who forced the objection down his throat. So this is one of the most shameful things, is to see the Supreme Court rules be circumvented in this fashion when they put a protective mechanism in there for ordinary people, ordinary witnesses who might not want to be on camera that we would, of course, respect. And every single time that it's been invoked, not most of the time, every single time, it's been lawyers. Um, now, they mentioned there are privileged private matters. Well, if that was true, the transcript would have been sealed. They would not have released the transcript or the JAVS videos to us if there were privileged private matters. Because once those JAVS videos and transcripts are released, everything that's privileged and private would be suddenly public. So clearly, there was no privilege concern here because we have the jabs and nothing was sealed. The uh, attorney-client privilege is one of the biggest pieces of nonsense I've heard. It's almost like they're just trying to fool you guys with, you know, big words. 
this attorney-client privilege is a very serious thing. And in fact, if you watched our recent coverage of the state of Nevada versus Brian Belisario, you will see the attorney-client privilege in action. It is so powerful that it actually removed even the prosecutor from the courtroom. Why did that not happen here? Because this attorney-client privilege assertion is nonsense. For this type of proceeding, a habeas corpus proceeding, which, by the way, is extraordinarily routine and common. These are not rare proceedings. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to show you guys what one of these look like, because they're so common. For these types of proceedings, the defend or well, he's not the defendant now, he's a petitioner, Michael McDonald, he has to waive his attorney-client privilege because he's accusing his um, attorney, def former defense attorney, of such an egregious level of incompetence that it violated his Sixth Amendment right, which requires his attorney to take the stand and discuss these things. So the attorney-client privilege was waived. You guys would have seen that on camera if you were watching. And there was no attorney-client privilege. Again, if there was attorney-client privilege, the transcript would have been sealed. This is what happened in the state of Nevada versus Bradley Belisario. They closed the court and they sealed the transcript. They sealed the motions. There was no attorney-client privilege here because we have the transcript and we have the jabs video. This was all released. All of this information. Another thing that uh, Craig Mueller objects to is the inner workings of his office being exposed. No. If that was the case, we wouldn't have the transcript and we wouldn't have the jabs video right now. None of that was sealed. So this is another thing that he just used to, to basically have us take down the high-definition camera. We're going to talk about what the actual consequences of what they did at the end of my explanation so you can see what the point of all of this was. But I'm doing is going line by line through each of their objections to show you that none of this is true. So District Court Judge uh, Christina Silva is, according to um, Craig Mueller, gave us an admonition that we didn't follow. He said this before. We've already talked about this before. This is an old objection that he's raised many times. In fact, we published all of the uh, District Court Judge Christina Silva hearings, every single one. So if you guys have been watching both series from beginning to end, you'll already know that Mr. Mueller lied about this. But um, what happened was there were people who were watching the live stream who apparently contacted the district attorney's office with new evidence. So if you've watched this trial, you'll already know. What happened was Chris, Judge Christina Silva said that this evidence was not disclosed to Mr. Mueller ahead of trial. So if you want to use it, we you can do that, but we'll have to declare a mistrial. We didn't break any rules. It was purely a strategic decision by the state of Nevada. They got new evidence from somebody who was watching, which is totally something that happens when there's coverage of a proceeding. And they decided that they did not want to forego the new evidence. The state of Nevada decided that the evidence was valuable enough that it was worth it for them to go ahead and do this trial all over again. And if you you really want to see for yourself, all you have to do is go through the playlist and watch for yourself and you'll see all of this unfold. You don't have to take my word for it. So now that we've gone through the contradictions, we'll talk a little bit about of some of the obvious mistakes that District Court Judge Ronald Israel made. So one of the things that is very obvious is that he said that this was not a trial, so the Supreme Court rules did not apply. However... I'm going to go ahead and pull this up so you guys can see for yourself. As you can see here, a proceeding is defined under SCR 229 sub 1b, which includes any trial, hearing, motion, hearing on an order to show cause or petition, or any other matter held in open court which the public is entitled to attend. The public was entitled to attend this proceeding because if it wasn't, it would have been closed to the public. Also, after we took down the camera, um, District Court Judge Ronald Israel said, you know, you don't have to leave. You can sit down and watch with your own eyes. So once again, even even not even counting the transcript or the jazz video, all of these concerns of privilege and privacy and attorney-client privilege and this issue of apparently the proceeding being special and not open to the public is nonsense because the public was entitled to attend the proceeding and it fits within the definition of what a proceeding is. So... Some people might say, hold on a second, well, why couldn't you just appeal that? Well, that is a really good point. The media request that was filed was filed on, and I'm going to go ahead and pull this up as well, uh, June 25th, 2022. 
the court, District Court Judge Ron Israel, approved it on June 29th, 2022. So no objections were filed. Months after month after month, no objections were filed. Then on November 20th, right before the proceeding, occur, sorry, January 20th, right before the proceeding occurs, which is, what is that, almost six months later, that's when the objections are raised. And that's when District Court Judge Ronald Israel abuses his discretion. Now we can't challenge it. If District Court Judge Ronald Israel would have made these assertions after objections that would have been filed maybe within weeks or a month or two, we could have taken it to the Supreme Court and had the Supreme Court intervene and correct his error. However, the attorneys and District Court Judge Ronald Israel waited six months to make their decision, their erroneous decision, right before the proceeding itself, knowing that we would not be able to get the Supreme Court to intervene in time. How do we know this? Because we've tried. We've tried to get the Supreme Court to intervene even um, three or four days in advance, even a week or two in advance in the past, and both times the Supreme Court of Nevada had to invoke the mootness exception. Sorry. One time they dismissed, the other time they invoked the mootness exception because they just didn't have time to get to it. If these objections would have been made in a timely fashion, I think that with six months of time, they could have quickly reviewed and made and made certain that um, District Court Judge Ronald Israel made these errors and corrected him. So that was a strategic thing that both the bench and the attorneys probably kept in mind. I normally wouldn't say something like that, except, you know, to get an assertion from the court and the lawyers that, you know, this isn't a trial, so therefore it doesn't fall within the purview of the rules. I mean, it's so patently false that, to me, that's just one of the big red flags to, you know, all of this that happened. So um, this notion of not filming witnesses, I mean, if that was the case, that you didn't, you couldn't film witnesses just because they didn't want to be filmed, I can't imagine the outrage that would have been expressed at the televised coverage of the Zimmerman trial or the Johnny Depp trial. That's something that the judge is supposed to exercise his discretion on, and as I mentioned before, every single time that that, that discretion has been exercised, it's always been to protect lawyers which is one of the most disgraceful things that I've ever seen, but I continue to see it. So the last thing that I was going to go ahead and point out is, and I mentioned this right before I started, is this is not an isolated incident. I've seen other judges do this too. For example, District Court Judge David Jones protected three lawyer witnesses, but there are varying degrees at which judges do this. Um, for example, with uh, J Judge David Jones, he said we had to keep the camera off of the witnesses, but we could still record them. Um, with Judge Israel, he wanted the entire camera taken down. And... This is really just a manifestation of judges and lawyers wheeling and dealing. The only difference is instil instead of them wheeling and dealing, you know, the rights of the parties and the actual substance of the case, they're wheeling and dealing the public's right to access and they're wheeling and dealing away the transparency. And um, this is something, I guess, I mean, I could go through a list. There's like eight or nine different, ten different judges that have done this before. As they try and say, we don't like the camera, we don't want the camera, but you can sit down and take notes. Or you have to keep the camera off these lawyers. The lawyers don't want to be recorded, stuff like that. They find ways to allow some transparency, but not all of the transparency. And there are all sorts of different reasons as to why judges and lawyers do this. Sometimes it's to just placate the lawyers. Sometimes it's because the judge himself doesn't like the camera. Um, it really, there's no point in getting into all the details. I, I guess at this point of my explanation, I think I've explained to you guys... Um, sort of the nuts and bolts as to what happened and uh, it's disappointing that we see stuff like this from the bench but I think it's important that you guys keep in mind that there are judges like this this is a thing that is is a continuing issue that I have with some judges who really just do not want to respect the Supreme Court's um, rules on camera access and I don't know if I've mentioned this before but the Supreme Court has promulgated these rules because of this type of problem they recognize that some judges just don't like cameras. And so they've created these rules to make it very difficult for lawyers and judges to interfere with camera access because the camera is there as a mechanism to educate and inform the public. It matters. Um, you know, I, I, I go ahead and, and mention the conclusion. You know, if, if none of this stuff makes sense, why did the judges and lawyers do it? The answer is because it, it very greatly diminishes our ability to present to you what's going on. Yeah, we lose our ability to educate and inform. It weakens our ability to educate and inform if we have to resort to transcripts, if we have to write an article. People learn best when they get to see and hear from themselves. And the high-definition camera and audio is one of those tools that we use to amplify the, our ability to present to the public what's going on in these courtrooms. So when District Court Judge Ron Israel and other judges who've interfered with camera access before do things like this, what they're actually doing is trying to find a way to minimize our ability to spread these videos to the public. 
When they reduce it from high definition footage to JAVS coverage, it's terrible video quality. So that has an impact on how many viewers will watch. When they drop us down to audio only, that's even more damaging to our ability to educate and inform the public. And in this case, Judge Israel actually wanted to reduce us to just a transcript. That's how bad this example was. Luckily, we were able to get assistance from an attorney and enforce the release of the JAVS videos. But I mean, that it, it, people just are not going to sit down and read a transcript. So that's what they're doing. That's what these judges and lawyers are doing when they interfere with camera access. Is they're trying to make it so that our ability to present to you guys what the courtrooms look like and how they operate is as difficult as possible, is as low grade as possible to minimize how many people actually watch the videos. Um, all of the other concerns that the court had, that the lawyers had, um, don't make any sense because they're all about to come out right now anyway with the, the jabs video so with that being said let's go ahead and continue our coverage of uh michael mcdonald versus the warden um i'm not gonna allow videoing of mr mcdonald and i would invoke the rule of exclusion your honor so to the extent the state's gonna call mr mueller i would ask that you can vote that's fine standing face the clerk raise the right hand to be sworn you do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Michael McDonald, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. Thank you. You can have a seat. Yes. Did you um, retain counsel to represent you in that matter? Yes. Um, who was the individual that you sought to represent you? Uh, there's two individuals that came, Robert Curran and uh, it was it, Mueller, Craig Mueller took my okay. case. At what point, um, at what point after the state filed um, the initial charges against you in this particular matter, did you hire or retain Mr. Mueller? Uh, from the beginning, like yeah. right after, right after the first indictment or whatever it was. Okay. Did he represent you through preliminary hearing? Uh, yes. Did he represent you then um, after indictment? Before you go on, the media can still be present. You can take notes. You can do whatever you want. We don't do summary reporting. I'm sorry? We don't do summary reporting. We only do electronic. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, okay. So did he represent you after indictment? Yes. And then how about at trial? Yes. After trial? Yes. At sentencing? Yes. On appeal? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Now I want to ask you a few questions about um, some issues that occurred during the pendency of your, um, of your case. Did there come a time that you recollect while this case was pending that Mr. Mueller came to you to discuss a possible negotiation? I believe it was twice. Do you recall approximately when that was relative to your trial date? Once when I was out on bail, and I, I believe he, there was a, um, he discussed it. He, I didn't really even get to look through the paperwork, but he said, um, I, I believe there, there was an offer for a, a wobbler. So there was a, he, for, to, to drop all 16 felonies to a, a misdemeanor um, or conspiracy to commit wiretapping and perjury, I'd do one to three probation, and then I'd get a misdemeanor. Okay. And he told me I'm not taking it. And he gave me okay, so let me back up for just a second. He actually, so he told you that there was an offer that it had been extended by the prosecutor handling the case. Is that correct? Yeah. And that offer was to admit to a felony um, offense and a, and a gross misdemeanor? Uh, I believe that's correct. And then the offer also included a, an agreement that you would do probation as a sentence? Yeah. 
and that after probation, if you successfully completed, you could withdraw your plea to the felony and plead to a simple misdemeanor. I believe that's how it works. I, I didn't understand. Okay. Well, was that generally your understanding of the negotiation or no? That's what I understood it to be, but like I said, I didn't get to you. Did you accept that negotiation? I was told you're not taking it, so I, w I wasn't given sound counsel on what the ramifications were of if I took that or not. He said, you're a political prisoner, nobody's ever been charged with this, there's no way you're going to prison. Okay, based on the advice, so wait, let me back up. So, so you understood that your counsel was telling you that you would be successful at trial? Yeah, I believe, I believe that's the, what, how he put it. He said, there's no way you're going to be charged with this. He was trying to get it dismissed. In the beginning. Okay. Was that successful, that motion to dismiss? No. Okay. And um, so as a result of your conversations with your counsel, did you decide to reject the negotiation? I feel like I wasn't given the option to uh, to have sound counsel or, or guidance on what, whether to take the, the plea or not. Um, that The one time he brought that up, um, what he said when I was on bail, another time when I was in a holding cell. He said, you're not taking it. There's, like I said, I wasn't given the option to. Okay. And, and so you felt like even if you had wanted to, you, it wasn't in your best interest to do that? Uh, I believe so at the time. Okay. And at the time, did you want to take the negotiation? And at the time, no. Did you eventually, before trial at any point, get to the point where you wanted to take the negotiation? I wanted to have uh, weigh my options. And, uh, I didn't think in a million years I'd go to prison for three years for filing a document to see my own children. Okay. Um, so you felt like you didn't adequately weigh the options and, and consider the pros and cons of going to trial versus okay. the negotiation. Objection leading. I, I wasn't given. Sustain. I'll, I'll rephrase. Please. Um, so did you did you weigh did you feel like you weighed your options at the time that were available to you? No, I was not given all the options. Um, from what I was told, you're not taking it. It, was, it wasn't an option, pretty much. He, he just said, you're not taking it. This is ridiculous. And yeah, it, there wasn't a proper discussion or guidance on what the ramifications were either way. Uh, he said, there's no way you're going to prison. So yeah, so, I was misled. So was there a discussion about the, the likelihood of prevailing on all of the charges that you were originally charged with? Uh, he just said, you're not going to prison. And then did he recommend taking the negotiation versus not taking it? He said you're not taking it. Okay. Did you feel at that point like uh, it was in your best interest to take the negotiation? I wasn't sure. I've never been involved in, like, yeah, I, I wasn't sure at the time what to do. I was um, overwhelmed with, I didn't understand the, what the, the, the totality could be, you know, then going to prison for three years. Is well, let, let me discuss three. that then. So in terms of, uh, was there any discussion with you guys about what the implications might be if you were convicted on one or more of the charges that you were charged with? No, he just said you're not going to prison, no matter what. He just said there's no way you're going to prison. So he conveyed to you the notion that you'd be successful at trial? Uh, said, yeah, I, it, the way he put it, it was it, it wouldn't even go to trial. But if it did, there's no way I'd be charged or thrown in, in prison for so as a consequence of that, did you think that taking the negotiation would be in your best interest? At the time, no. Okay. Um, do you feel like, as you sit here now, that you were able to, given the, those limited discussions and the approach that Mr. Mueller took with you, do you feel like you had the opportunity to meaningfully consider and weigh the pros and cons of a negotiation versus going to trial? No. Okay. Then I want to move on and talk to you for, um, for a minute about the sentencing. After you were convicted, um, did you have any discussions with Mr. Mueller about your sentencing hearing? I don't recall. Like I said, he never came to visit me in jail. Um, the only time I got to speak to him was in the holding cell or at the bench. Okay. Um, and I did... did in, in the limited conversations that you did have, did you uh, did he talk to you about putting to getting letters of support? No. To submit to the court for your sentencing hearing? Never. How about any um, information from family and friends about your emotional state during the pendency of your divorce proceedings? Not at all. Okay. 
How about anything such as like proof that you would be able to obtain gainful employment had you been um, given probation? I, I believe he might have stated something at sentencing, but I, I don't recall him saying anything to me about, about that. Okay. And then, um, and so as a result of those lack of conversations, did you on your own think to give Mr. Mueller any of that documentation? I actually brought it up to him a couple of times. Yeah, some people that I was uh, incarcerated with told him that, hey, you probably need this or that, and I brought that uh, to his attention. And yeah, it was like right, right before the sentencing, and it was, I guess, it was too late, or I, he never discussed it with me. Okay, and so to your knowledge, was any any information to that extent pro provided to the court of sentencing? Not that I know. Of. Okay, then I want to talk about again. Then I believe um, there might have been some letters at sentencing. I, I believe I don't I don't recall though what. what Okay. Then let me ask you about um, in the time um, before and after your sentencing, there were um, motions that you filed to dismiss your counsel. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Do you recall the circumstances um, under which you filed? Let's talk about the first one. I tried to get him off the case a few times because of he was going through a bad divorce, and I said, can you... Okay, well, I don't want you to talk about Mr. Mueller's personal life. Like, I, like what, I, what I want to focus on is, why did you file the first one? Did you want him on your case or not? I asked him several times before uh, trial, like, can you handle this? Can you do this? I'd like to go with the public defender. But that, it's after I got thrown in the fish tank, I believe, was when I filed that, that motion, because I, I did not want him to do the appeal. His, he's, his off, he's lost most of his staff. He, he does not have the... the the resources to complete a proper appeal, nor did he come and get all the details or facts of the case in order to present that. Okay, so um, at some point then toward the, uh, the, at some point did you file a pro per motion to dismiss counsel? Yes, I did. Okay, and what was your goal with that? To get a public defender to do my appeal. Did you want Mr. Mueller to stay on the case? No, I did not. Okay, then did you file a second motion to dismiss counsel? I poss possibly did, I don't know if it was a wiretapping or another uh, okay. One out before that, because I found out later that it was that he told. Okay, let me let me. Cut, I, I want you to stay focused on my question. Okay, a, a, after after your sentencing, did you file another motion to dismiss your counsel? I believe so. And what was your goal with that? To get him off my case for the wiretapping and to to be able to uh, get a public defender, a proper counsel, on my appeal. Okay, so this wasn't your wiretapping case, so let's focus on just this case. So you were concerned, if I understand you correctly, about Mr. Mueller representing you on appeal. Yes, I do not think he would be effective at all. On that. Now, at the hearing on that motion to dismiss counsel, do you recall you were not present, correct? No, he never put a, I don't believe he put Okay, let me just ask you, were no. you present at that hearing? No, I wasn't. Okay, and then, um, and as of the date of that hearing, had you indicated that you wanted to withdraw that motion? No, I wasn't there. And no, I did not. Okay. If you had been present, would you have told the court that you wanted to move forward with that motion? Yes, I wanted another counsel. Okay. For appeal? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Mueller was also late. He wasn't coming there. There's a lot of different issues. Why objection, no question pending. Sustained. Um, Were you concerned with the appeal that was ultimately filed on your behalf? Yes. And why? It didn't have all the facts of the case, didn't state the reasons for that weren't brought up on, on at trial or wasn't presented. Do you recall how many issues were prosecuted in that appeal? I believe there's only four or five, possibly. I don't if I told you two, would that be? Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of which was ultimately withdrawn? I don't remember. But suffice it to say, you did. You wanted to move forward with your, with your motion to dismiss Mr. Mueller as of uh, on both motions that you filed, the first and the second. Yes, and somebody read the. Is that court, a yes? Yes, somebody read the court minutes and said that he said that I was good with his counsel and and that was incorrect information. Okay, I have nothing further, Your Honor. Cross. So you retained Mr. Mueller as counsel, correct? Yes, I did. So you could have fired him at any time, correct? I believe so. Okay, but but you never fired fired him. I tried you. several times. <laughs> okay. When you say you you tried to, were you unable to tell him that he was fired? 
he never came to, to visit me while I was incarcerated for those eight months in city jail, nor the eight months in county uh, pending trial. Right. Are trial. you saying you had no no way of contacting him? His yeah. office is he was very hard to get a hold of. Okay, but you actually worked in Mueller's office, Mr. Mueller's office, for a period of time, isn't that correct? As an um, attorney, I helped him, not as an attorney, not as an attorney. <laughs> no. Okay, so you didn't perform any sort of work in Mr. Mueller's office. Uh, I might have helped him out with some things. Okay, you didn't have a desk in his office. Uh, there, there was a desk. Okay, so you weren't you weren't there on a regular basis. I was for a little bit before trial, yes. Or before being pre, pre uh, uh, detained. Yeah. And since you retained Mr. Mueller, I mean, isn't it? I mean, isn't it true that he he was not appointed by the court, correct? No. Okay. So it's fair to say that you didn't need to ask the court to dismiss him. You could have fired him on your own, correct? Well, I object to that. It calls for a legal conclusion. He can state what he wanted to do. And I'm not sustaining it. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll move on. But again, you never informed you never informed the court that you had fired Mr. Mueller, correct? I believe well, I did. I would object to that as kind of misstating the evidence to the extent that he filed two motions to dismiss counsel. Okay. That's you seem to be arguing the facts. It's not an object uh, an objection that I've heard the facts. Go on. Okay, Mr. Mr. McDonald, it's true that you never informed the court that you that you had fired Mr. Mueller. Is that correct? I believe I said several times and I wasn't allowed to speak or they said you have to, to allow counsel to speak or something like that. I don't recall. Of course, brief indulgence. Now, do you recall a time that we were both in, we were both in court, um, I believe in Department 29, one of the many times that this case was set for trial and you actually direct, directly asked me if you could have a wobbler. <laughs> uh, was that when Craig was not present and that, he, he was late and wasn't there? Possibly, yeah. I was trying to negotiate some kind of deal at the after. Okay. And, I, and I told you you needed to talk to your attorney, correct? And he wasn't present or didn't come that time. I was late. Okay. And although you were sentenced to prison in this case, eventually you completed the Hope for Prisoners program, isn't that right? That's correct. And you received a great deal of occupational and educational training as part of that program, correct? Uh, I finished a grant writing nonprofit management course. I'll pass the witness. Redirect? Not for me, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, I think the record at this point, other than those issues that I needed Mr. McDonald to kind of flesh out before the court, I think the record speaks for itself on what was and wasn't done, and I would, um, I would rest at this point. State. The state calls Craig Mueller. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Greg Allen Mueller, M U E L L E R. Thank you. Go ahead. And before we begin, Mike, you sure you want me to, you're relieving me of attorney client privilege here? We, uh, he was canvassed. I understand. I Sir, go ahead. Okay. Mr. Mueller, when you when you took uh, Mr. McDonald's case, did you determine any defenses that you believed could be raised on his behalf? It was inconceivable to me, and remains inconceivable to me, that these cases proceeded in the fashion it did. In 30 years of criminal law, including a stint at the district attorney's office doing murderous cases, I've never seen anything like this prosecution. When I volunteered to help Mike pro bono, I anticipated a quick phone call or meeting at prelim 
this case would get resolved a misdemeanor and the case would have been closed. When the trial came up, there was nothing very, it was a very difficult case to defend. Most of it was already in videotape and he had alienated everyone in family court to the point that they had well documented the uh, falsity of, or the accusations in the case. Um, I remain and I still respectfully disagree with the court. I do not believe that this was a perjury. It was not a material misrepresentation of fact. The expert witness went back and adopted the opinion as basically factually correct, if, if not in proper form. And you mentioned no material misrepresentation of fact. Do you recall making that defense at trial? I actually, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, I've done 15 or 20 jury trials, maybe 10 or 12 between then and now. I have relatively little recollection. I remember Mike, I remember the case, and because it was such a one-off case and it was handled so unusually, I remember a lot of the administrative details, but I don't remember the cases, the day-to-day -day courtroom stuff. Okay, that's fair. But in terms of your the closing argument that you made at trial, would it would it surprise you um, if I if I were to tell you that at one point in dis discussing the perjury charge, you stated to the the jury, "Why do we think his financial affidavit is material in this particular hearing?" Does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar. I, there was okay. never seen anything quite like this go to trial before. Oh, you nobody. have no reason to dispute the transcript of your closing argument at I trial. I was zealous to the point of of. As, as far as I thought I could push it. And do you recall making an argument about intent to defraud? Yes, I okay. don't. I believe that element of the case was still uh, is still missing and, and was would have been a grant for post conviction relief. Now I want to talk to you about your communication with Mr. McDonald during the course of your representation. How did you communicate with him? Daily. Daily and in what environment? I had a, I just rented a, a Craig Kenny's old law office building. It was this big rambling mess of a building with 15 or 18 offices. And I gave Mike uh, an office as a paralegal or as an intern um, and a desk. And he was working on his cases uh, under my guidance. And he was also, I believe, Mike can correct me, but I recollect he actually helped me on administratively organizing files and putting some other cases together. But I talked to him almost every day, came in and said how he's doing. Okay. And how long of a period of time was that, like in terms of months? It all flows together so much, counsel. You know, it's, it's got 30 years of memories here. Um, um, he was there for a while, then he wasn't there for a while, I recall, then he was back again. Um, he was there for, for several months. Mike, can, Mike will know best, but he was there for a while. It wasn't just a day or two. He was there for an extended period of time. Okay. And during this period of time, um, when he was when he was in your office, I mean, did you discuss his case with him? I would have, but only tangentially. Uh, criminal practice is pretty much bomb defusal. You've got one bomb in front of you. You're defusing that. And next, and they pick up the next bomb and go to that one. Something that was three or four months ahead of time, unless it was really unusual, I wouldn't have spent a lot of time on. And did you discuss, um, did you discuss negotiating the case with him? <laughs> Counsel, you know how hard, yes, I did, I discussed negotiating the case with him, and you know how hard I pushed you to get a negotiation, and if memory serves, I was pretty adamant. We actually went up and talked to Steve Wolfson personally about this case, and I complained about how he seemed to have been singled out for specific treatment. Uh, on this case and the other, unlike anything I've seen for since. Okay. And the, the meeting you're referring to, that um, did that involve myself, uh, Wolfson, and some? I some think Lowley and Daskus was there, and yeah, there was a there was a whole room, I had the whole floor, and everyone listened very carefully to me. And so, during the course of your representation, did Mr. McDonald ever tell you that he didn't want you to represent him? No, I was representing him pro bono. Time he wanted someone to hire, if you could hire, have hired somebody, I would have um, had I known both these cases going to trial. In complete candor, I might not have volunteered to do it pro bono, but I, as I said before, it was my anticipation from Jump Street that these cases were going to negotiate and be very easy negotiation. He's a first time offender doing it, uh, and as memory serves, he did a pretty terrible job representing himself down in family court. I'm, I'm not sure. 
Um, he, he was actually pretty good at putting the papers and pleadings together. Um, but if he had money, someone else would have, he could have hired somebody. I, I, I still stand by it. I, I really thought this case would resolve very favorably and very quickly, both of them. I'll pass the witness. Cross. Now, um, Mr. Mueller, uh, when you say that you did it pro bono, uh, you received no compensation, or did you receive some, just not a lot, relative to the work that you did? I recollected entirely pro bono. If Mike may have given the bookkeeper some money or forwarded some money to the bookkeeper, that's fine. It might very well have been true. I'm not. I wouldn't disagree with it. But the bookkeeper was on a different floor, and, and I wouldn't have kept up on it. Okay, so he, it's it's very possible that he paid your bookkeeper around $2,500 for the representation? That sounds about right. So it's about what I would have asked for for the case of prelim. So if he, if he gave us some money for prelim, but he didn't pay for either of the trial. And, and I have a very different philosophy of a lot of defense attorneys. I, I, I'm much more principled about things. I Once I take a client, I try very hard not to withdraw, because if I withdraw, the district attorneys know I will withdraw which makes it much harder to get deals in the future. So occasionally I'll get stuck in a spot like this where I do the case for free rather than let it know I, I steered, steered away from a gunfight. Right, or even do it at a discounted rate, like take some money but not really what would be sufficient I, to get you through the trial. In retrospect, had I known what I was getting into and uh, been, uh, I would have probably asked for twenty-five dollars or $50,000 for as much work as went into this case. How about any payments by a third party, um, about $5,000 coming from a third party while the case was pending? I don't recollect. Uh, it's possible if you send me a Duke Estecum to do the accounting. I've, I've, got, I've had the same accounting software for the last 30 years, so I've got every dime I've ever received in the law practice. But I don't recall that. If he says we, if somebody gave us some money, I don't doubt it. Okay. So it's possible that you were paid possibly $2,500 by Mr. McDonald and maybe another 5000 by a third party. I don't have any dis reason to disagree. If, um, I don't have any reason to doubt Mr. McDonald's assertion if that's happened. I know that the way I do administrate the office is different than most guys. Um, it was my observation as a district attorney, and I stand by it, that 95 or 98 percent of the cases resolve in justice court, as you know and I only charge for justice court, then when it becomes, uh, after a, a couple weeks in district court, if the case doesn't resolve, then I'll go back and look for a, a trial fee if I think it's necessary. So that would make sense, two separate, pay, if a client pays you a certain fee through preliminary hearing, say like $2,500 through prelim, and then a second fee through trial. And that would be very consistent with the way I've operated the office over the last 30 years. Okay. And so if I represented to you that, um, According to Mr. McDonald, those fees were paid to your office in those separate sums. You wouldn't have any reason, as you sit here now, to dispute that. No, I wouldn't have any reason to dispute it. I, I my recollection is it was pro bono, or the vast majority of the work was pro bono. Okay. Now, the um, prosecutor asked you some questions about Mr. McDonald working in your office, and he did work in your office for a period of time. Is that right? Yes. I and did. that period of time, to your recollection, would have been on the order of maybe two or three months, something like that? Does that sound Somewhere fair? Somewhere about there. Then he had something else he had to go do or wanted to go do, and then wasn't there for a while, then came back, was there for a couple of weeks. I wasn't paying him, and um, he actually objectively did a pretty good job. He, he looks like he could, would make a very fine paralegal if he had actually put this, got some training for it. He was actually, so during the pendency of the case, just to kind of refresh your memory, so um, at, at points during the pendency of the case, he was actually in custody. Is that correct? I don't recall it that way. I do know he got remanded into custody, but I do know there was a period of time when he was not there. If he was in custody, I, I wouldn't. And I'm not trying to be a, a smart <coughs> I, had, I had 14 or 15 employees at this time, and so, you know, I... What, yeah. what, what an intern was doing or not doing, it was not anything that would have made a mental mark. So let me ask it this way. I, I've been where you're sitting. I know what it's like to try to reconstruct a case years after the fact. So if I told you that, um, that if I asked you, was it possible to your recollection that Mr. McDonald 
was in custody on two different occasions during the pendency of the case. Would you have any reason to dispute that? No. He, Mr. McDonald has the ability to get under people's nerves. If he got remanded a couple times, that's consistent with my uh, observation of him. Yeah, so if he was if he was in custody a couple times, a couple meaning twice during the pendency of this this matter, and then out of custody for a few months where you saw him with some regularity at your office, you wouldn't have any reason to dispute that? No. Okay. Sounds um, about right. And the prosecutor asked you a couple questions about conversations that you had with Mr. McDonald while he was working at your office very generally. You talked about the case? Yes. Oh, we would have talked about the case. Okay. I'm sure of it. In fact, that <laughs> would have probably been primarily his only interest in talking to me, was to talk about the case. And, um, and there was questions from the prosecutor about also the, um, the fact that you just brought up at trial the um, issue of the falsity with respect to the perjury charge. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And so now I want to ask you some questions since we have the general question about conversations that you had with with Mr. McDonald and forgive me your honor may I sit down because my yeah, absolutely. vision stinks and it's easier for me to see um, so I um, I want to first ask you about the forgery charges you recall that there were some forgery charges in this particular case yes in and fact, there was there were tick. actually um, to my recollection I think there were three of them just tickled a very strong recollection. Just the whole thing came back to me from being in justice court in front of it. Melanie Tobias. Is that the argument you're talking about? Well, yeah, and, and okay. moving forward yeah, to this the trial. Came back to me. I remember this. Yeah, I, I viscerally disagreed with the judge binding the case over and the, the charge. So, um, and I don't blame you. Um, so, with respect to the forgery charges, there was there were three forgery charges. You recall that? There was, it was, uh, sorry, I won't use the words I learned in the Navy. They were trumped up manure, was, was uh, what we like, but yeah. Uh, and those forgery charges derive from this letter written by Mr. McDonald's therapist. Yes. And in fact, what had happened was Mr. McDonald had gone to see a therapist in advance of a custody um, issue that he had pending in family court. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And he had um, he had spoken to the therapist after at one of his therapy sessions about writing a letter for him for his custody case. Yes. I... And, and in that letter he had asked that his therapist indicate that he would not be a danger to himself or his kids as that related to his custody case. Yes. She agreed to do so. That's my recollection of the testimony. The initial draft of the letter did not include that statement. That's correct. Um, and, but, and, and Mr. McDonald, upon seeing that it didn't include that statement, he had asked her, would you rewrite this to include a statement that I'm not a danger to myself or my, my family? Yes. And she agreed. Yes. And so when you say that you thought that these allegations were kind of unfounded, it was because um, uh, when, well, let me, let me back up. After, when, in the, by the time that Mr. McDonald went to submit documents in advance of his custody hearing, had Ms. Ms. Hunterton had not updated the letter to reflect that specific provision about, um, about Mr. McDonald being, not being a danger to his kids or his family or yes. himself. He went back and unfortunately put the document in proper form apparently got permission from her, at my recollection, got permission from her to sign it. Right. Which is why there was the argument about there not being any intent to defraud when he later submitted the letter that contained the statement that Ms. Hunterton had agreed to include but just hadn't. That's correct. I, okay. It is my understanding of the law on this point that it's not forgery if I authorize someone to sign it. I frequently get caught in the business with a business problem back in the office and I'm in the courtroom and I have to call and authorize my bookkeeper to sign my name. That doesn't make it a forgery if, it's, if she has my permission. Okay. And that became kind of a centerpiece of your defense, at least at trial, that there was no intent to defraud. Yes, ma'am. I okay. thought this case should never have been filed and it shouldn't have resulted in a conviction. 
And let me ask you, um, aside from the trial, one of the ways that as defense lawyers we can attack the propriety of a, of a charge is to challenge it by way of a motion to dismiss. Yes. And um, on a petition for writ of habeas corpus deriving from an indictment or preliminary hearing. Yes. Okay. On the issue of this, the lack of intent to defraud, um, it's my understanding you did not file a motion to dismiss the forgery charges, arguing that there was no showing or no prima facie uh, articulation in the charging document of intent to defraud. We did do that or we did not? You did not. Are you sure? I'm not trying to be a smart aleck because I remember sitting right where you were and just about pushing the judge as far as I could on contempt, uh, arguing that and got some pretty harsh pushback on that argument. So let me, maybe, I'm happy to go through the... Might be um, my memory not served me correctly or maybe a different occasion, but I think the judge might remember I was pretty adamant about a couple points in this case. Yeah, court's indulgence. Um, but the record is the record, but I very, very strong, have a very strong recollection of being here a couple times fighting with the judge on that. Yeah, and you know that what, that, that's a fair recollection because you actually did file a few pretrial motions, if I may okay. discuss them with you, if that's okay. Um, on October 16th of 2018, you filed a motion to dismiss. Well, wait, let me back up just to orient you. So initially the case went through prelim, did it not? Yes. It and is. then after it was bound over to district court, um, the prosecution went and went to the grand jury and got an indictment. I don't recall that. Okay, if, if I told you that that's what happened, you wouldn't have any reason to dispute that. I wouldn't have any reason And to so dispute. then after the indictment, that's, that is the indictment is the case that ultimately went to trial, correct? Yes. And so after that indictment was filed, you filed some pretrial motions. Uh, if that's what I recollect, I do remember being in here going pretty hard at the judge trying to get these charges dismissed. Yeah, that's, no, that's the document. You did. Um, and one of them filed in October of 2018 was your motion to dismiss. You recall filing that? I remember arguing with it. And what I really recall very candidly, this is my memory. <laughs> my memory is actually very consistent. There are many things I should remember that I do not. Usually what I do remember, I remember very accurately. And I remember standing right where you were and thinking to myself, I better pull back or I'm going to get found in contempt. That's how adamant I was that the judge grant Mr. McDonald relief. And I actually remember that I figured I was right at the line because I have not yet been thrown in contempt. Yeah, you you um, you definitely, it came through in the um, transcript, the vigor with which you argue the arguments. What I want to do is I want to walk through some of the things that you did do, some of the things that you may not have done, um, and ask and kind of clarify um, whether or not there were discussions with Mr. McDonald or strategery regarding those. Okay. And I think I have to object at this point. It's beyond the scope of my direct. Well, because she asked about conversations that he had. So, um, so let's talk about, so the motion to dismiss that was filed in October of 2018. Um, do you recall that? I remember the, I remember the give and take with the judge. And um, in that, that motion, it raised essentially two issues. One was the lack of a marker notice served to Mr. McDonald. That's pretty standard. I would have I filed that routinely. I and there was that. also an argument in there that um, there had not been adequate presentation of exculpatory evidence, the grand jury presentment, regarding Ms. Hunterton's feeling about the letter that was written by Mr. McDonald. I don't reluctant recollect that argument at that point, but that certainly would have been an argument that would have lied and one that I would have found attractive. You don't have any reason to dispute that. I no, if you, that um, sounds like something, I just know my thought process, and that sounds like something I would do, would have done. But that that motion didn't contain necessarily an argument that um, there was an insufficient showing of any evidence that Mr. Um, McDonald intended to defraud with the, with the letter, the Hunterton letter, I'll call it. Okay. Is, would that be... Correct? I, I don't recall specifically. Okay. And then how about, um, but would you, you don't have any reason to dispute what I'm telling you. No, that either. seems very consistent with the way I viewed the case. And if you tell me the document exists, I would probably agree with you. That sounds the way I, I viewed the issue and, and certainly would have filed it and signed and filed it if, if I hadn't. And then there was another one filed in November. It was a motion under NRS 173.075. <laughs> that pertain to the perjury charges. Recall that. 
No, not specifically at the, at the moment. But if you tickle my memory, as you can tell, when it comes back, it comes back after. <sighs> You've got to get my memory. Well, the, the arguments in there had to do with the um, adequacy of the notice on count six and eight, the perjury charges. Oh, that's right. The um, yeah. Now, Ms. Mishler, uh, deference counsel, I don't need to be snarky here, but went out of her way to make as many charges as possible uh, on Mr. McDonald. And I didn't, thought they were duplicative and it did, it did not give me enough notice. Okay. Um, and, but there was nothing in that pleading about the forgery charges. That I recall, no. Okay. And then there was another, a motion dismissed for vindictive prosecution and double jeopardy that was filed in November, the next day, um, November 5th of 2018. Yes, that's all completely consistent with my view of the case. I, I have never changed my view of the case. and. Maintain that view of the case this morning here in court. And in fact, that motion really kind of um, went after or kind of really articulated your view of the case because that in that one, you you um, alleged that there was unfair targeting of Mr. McDonald in this case. It was I was and, and was and remained deeply uncomfortable with what happened in this case. Detective Chio went to Mr. McDonald's personal effects and then looked like they were just fishing around to find charges to file. I've never seen any, candidly, I'm, and I'm, among colleagues here, all of great experience, I've never seen this level of And then there manure. was, I'm in, sorry. I've never seen this level of manure in law enforcement in Nevada ever. And then um, in, in addition to that unfair targeting argument, you also raised the du double jeopardy claim as it related to the contempt proceeding in family court and then the success of prosecution in district court. Family court judges have all the district court powers. That if, I, if I were sitting in district court judge and was unhappy that somebody had filed something false in front of me, I'm not a subtle man. I know what I would have done as a judge. I'd have thrown him in jail on the spot. Why we were up here again is beyond me. And then, so so now going back to the, the forgery charge and that element of intent to defraud that we talked about with respect to the Hunterton letter. So challenging the propriety of that charge that wasn't done in those pretrial motions. No. I... You didn't have a strategic reason for not raising it in those pretrial motions. Counsel, I don't recall. I, as you bring up these motions, it's bringing back memories that I did not have when I sat down, but I don't specifically recall. Okay. Let's then let's talk about the um, the. Uh, the motion to, or let's talk about the offering of false instrument charges. So there were um, there were a few. Let me give you the exact number. I got to flip around here. We have um, there were three offering of false instrument charges. You recollect that? There was an affidavit. You got to file down in family court uh, when kids are involved because deadbeat dads or deadbeat moms don't want to pay. Um, the allegation was Mike had filed an older, or Mike had filed an older one again when it had changed, and then they so that they accused him of a falsity as opposed to just the obvious, which is he wasn't careful with his paperwork. So I'm going to ask you some questions about that actual document, but but um, before we get into that, um, uh, in in preparation for the trial and. The, and looking at pretrial motions, um, did you did you look at the statute, the offering of false instrument statute, upon which that the offering of false instrument charges were based? I almost certainly would have. I don't know that that's not a case. That's not a charge we normally see in a courtroom very often in, in criminal court. That would be NRS two thirty nine point three three zero. I'll have to take your word on that. Okay, <laughs> it's not in the criminal statutes. It's in the public records statutes. That's right. I remember that now. Okay. And um, it, uh, it criminalizes the, I'm just going to read the statute, the procuring or offering of a false or forged instrument, correct? Yes. I, you're Take my word on it. I, um, I actually know it's all coming back to me. You're right. I actually had to go pull the book on this because I'd never seen it in criminal court before. To be registered or recorded in any public office, correct? I don't recall the exact text. 
Okay, if I showed you a copy of the statute, or would you, I guess just to streamline it, would you have any reason to dispute my recitation of it? No, no, I actually remember reading that and thinking, boy, they really don't like this kid. They're really working overtime on this case. I don't disagree with you there. Um, uh, registered in any public office, which instrument, if genuine, might be filed or registered in a uh, recorded public office under any law of the state? Yes. And yep. if you file any false or forged instrument in such a public office, it would be a Category C felony, correct? I, I read that statute, and as, as it was coming back to me, I remember that was like for falling, filing a false deed or claim to property. Right. Okay. So let me let me ask you about that for just a minute. Um, so they charged Mr. The prosecution charged Mr. McDonald for the offering a forged instrument um, for his. Um, the December 4th motion to recuse um, his family court judge in which he appended the Hunterton letter with the added sentence, correct? Yes. And they, they also charged him with account for the March 13th, 2018 filing of the exhibits that were submitted by Mr. McDonald in advance of his custody hearing. Yes, the prosecution here was about as aggressive as I've ever seen. I've never seen a first offender on an administrative case ever be prosecuted like this. And in fact, with that charge, with the March 13th offering a false instrument charge, they charged him for two exhibits that were in appended to um, his exhibit list, both the letter and the false or, and the financial disclosure form. Yes. And the they and then they charged him a third time with offering a false instrument on um, the Hunterton letter that was submitted on his March 21st second motion to recuse Judge Marquis. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And um, again, uh, with the with the um, offering a false instrument statute, it is it encompasses instruments, correct? I'm not an expert on that statute. That's not bread and butter of a criminal practice. That's pretty far out in left field. I, I read it. I remember looking at it, and I remember thinking, boy, I really don't like this guy when I read that. Because because the public record statute was meant to address legally operative documents, such as deeds, deeds. tax filings, that's what that I, type of thing. That's what I took it at. That's why I, I had to go look it up special now that I, I remember this. Not a letter written by a therapist. You've heard my view, counsel. I Is that a yes? Yes. And not a financial disclosure form that was created by a self-help center at the family courts. I have never, yes, I, Mr. McDonald is the poster child why no one's going to go down the family court and try to do their own case. But now, and let me just ask you, recognizing that now you had not filed any motions to dismiss or other pretrial motions challenging the propriety of those offering a false instrument charges um, as they pertained to the documents submitted in Mr. McDonald's family court case. No, I don't recall that. Okay. that and you didn't have any strategic reason for doing that. It fits the it fits the bare uh, outline of the statute. Um, I was getting no traction and got no traction any other pretrial motions at a certain point. I don't know that I would have continued beating my head against the wall. So, if anything, you just made a decision to not consider filing something like that because you felt like you were not getting anywhere with the other motions. I don't recall ever thinking about that, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. So, as you sit here right now, you don't recollect having a particular strategic decision that would have impelled you to not file a motion challenging the offering of false instrument statute as it related to the documents in Mr. McDonald's case. That was a novel use of the statute, and you know, if you got convicted of it, it would be a, a, whether a pellet issue and whether that should have been used in the first place. I mean, the whole case was very objectionable to me. I'm not a so you, man. I, so I just, I could have, could write a law review article on how many things I thought were done wrong on this case. And, okay, and none of that's changed. Of which utilization of this public record statute to encompass. A family court letter and financial disclosure form would be one. Yes, clearly that would not have been what was intended by the statute if Nevada had any judicial or any uh, uh, 
legislative history in that statute, I assure you they weren't talking about pro bono, pro, uh, proper family court representatives. So the fact that you didn't file a pretrial motion challenging this kind of a charge for the, the counts that alleged offering a false instrument, 3, 7, and 11, there was no strategic reason that you did not pursue that in the way of a pretrial motion. I don't know that I recall thinking about that, or Mike and I talked about that back at the office. Okay, so then you certainly can't say that there was a strategic reason. No, okay. that would have been. I, okay. Then um, let's go on to the perjury charge because you talked a little briefly about that also. Um, 